Okay. Okay. So we have uh, just started the recording of our second hour. Are there any questions from the first hour of discussion and interaction? Uh, I know it's a difficult uh, topic um, as uh, we address, uh, which we have addressed in the earlier lecture uh, on uh, failures that we face or challenges we face there, exercising faith in God. Any follow-up questions? All right. So let's move forward now to our next chapter, 18, I think it is, on talking about collective faith, the power of collective faith. So till now, uh, in this course, uh, we have been focusing on individual faith. That means you having faith in God uh, personally uh, for, for various things. Uh, but now we want to spend a little time talking on collective faith. And we find this in many places in scripture where, um, where two or more of us can agree together, right? And uh, the most uh, well-known verses of scripture, of course, are Matthew chapter 18, verses 18 and 19. Could somebody read that out for us, please? Matthew 18, 18 to 19. Matthew 18, 18 to 19, verse 18. Assuredly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. Number 19. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. Amen. Thank you. So... These, these two verses um, are very, very well known, uh, where Jesus says, if two of you agree on earth, right? two of you agree on earth, and then you ask for something, it'll be done for my father, by my father who is in heaven. Right? So this is where we're talking about collective faith, two or more of us coming into agreement. Right? Now, that word agree there, just to just as an interesting fact, is it's uh, the word that means harmonious or to be in accord or symphonize, something like a symphony or a harmony. Right? So that means we are together. Yeah, we are in harmony or in symphony, uh, just together agreeing on earth. Uh, or on on a certain matter, right? Concerning anything uh, that that we are praying about, asking about, right? So th there is this place of agreement in prayer, agreement in faith, that um, we as believers can come into, whether it's just two people or whether it's uh, you know a prayer group or whether it's a local church of uh, several, you know, maybe tens of people, hundreds of people, uh, all coming into agreement. Um, Jesus taught us that uh, it's it's uh, a place of power. It's a place where we can see things happen and God will respond to that collective faith of those people who are in agreement and asking about something. Now, we know that there is power when we are together, the Old Testament Ecclesiastes tells us you know, two are better than one. Uh, they have a good reward for their labor. That means they can achieve things together and they can uh, make things happen. There's this tremendous reward when they are working together uh, uh, in agreement. So we know that, and this is also true spiritually. So in the Bible, uh, we see several examples of collective faith in action. That means you know, we, we can see examples where two or more people came together, they prayed together, they believed God together, and then they saw the result. And I've just put down a few from the 
New Testament. You see this in both Old and New Testaments. So there is the time when uh, uh, the apostles, this is in Acts chapter 4, uh, they were you know, facing difficulty. They were being persecuted uh, in Acts chapter 4 and uh, uh, the they were being uh, they were being told not to preach they were being threatened they were to be told not to preach in the name of jesus so they were being threatened for that and so after they were you know they received all the threats from the people uh, they went back to their companions that means to their own group of people and they shared with them look this is what the chief priests and elders have said you know they have threatened us uh, they have told us not to preach in the name of Jesus and all of that. So what did they do? When they heard this, they raised their voice to God with one accord. So that means they were in agreement. And uh, so, you know, we, we don't know how many of them were there. There probably could be maybe uh, whether this companions are referring to just the 12 apostles or whether it's referring to 100 or 200 or 300 people but it seems like there was this big group of people who lifted up their voice to go with one accord that means they joined their hearts in faith and they said god you know they acknowledged the greatness of god and uh, they said lord you know look at their threats uh, but uh, they prayed together that they with all boldness they will speak the word and uh, that God would heal, and do signs and wonders in the name of Jesus. So they prayed together like this. They were in agreement that regardless of the threats of the people, they were going to go ahead and preach the word, and they were going to believe God for miracles. And it says when they, when they had prayed, there was a, the place was shaken. So there was like God giving them assurance. Yeah, I've heard your prayer. And they spoke the word of God with boldness. And eventually, you know, you in, in chapter 4 and chapter 5, uh, we see mighty things happening uh, in response to the prayer they prayed. You know, uh, there was great power that, with which the apostles gave witness. There was a couple, Ananias and Sapphira, their sin was exposed. And uh, many signs and wonders were done. And the sick were healed by Peter's shadow. Great numbers of people came from other cities, bringing sick people. And an angel of the Lord also brought Peter out of prison. Many, many things happened uh, when they prayed and said, Lord, we want to see signs and wonders in the name of your son, Jesus. So we see an example, collective faith. Uh, another interesting example is when Peter was in prison, this was Herod. He, you know, this was another time when King Herod uh, put Peter into prison. But it says here, constant prayer was offered by God for him, uh, offered to God for him by the church. That means there were this there were group of believers got together. They prayed together for Peter's release. And uh, supernaturally, an angel goes in and brings Peter out of prison, and Peter shows up out of the house at the house of uh, Mary, uh, the mother of John Mark, and um, you know that's, that was where the, these people were gathered together praying. And many of them, so we don't know how many, but there was must have been a good group of people praying for Peter, and you see the result. You know how God intervened as they collectively believed God for Peter's deliverance and protection. So this again, an, a, a, another example of collective faith, collective prayer, people agreeing together. Um, uh, another example we see is that of Paul, uh, how he was supernaturally healed. Uh, this is very interesting. I mean, when, when Paul had come to uh, uh, Lystra, so this was on his... Uh, First missionary journey, Paul and Barnabas, they were traveling through, which today would be modern day Turkey. Uh, they went through Antioch and Iconium and they came to Derby. And um, uh, sorry, they, they came to Iconium and there, uh, 
uh, a friend of mine couldn't they came to Lystra actually this happened at Lystra uh, and but there were people from Antioch and Iconium Jews who came over to Lystra and they stoned Paul they stoned him they dragged him out of the city uh, leaving him for dead you know, so you can imagine how how that must be uh, meaning they stoned him dragged him out of the city leaving him outside the city as supposing him to be dead but see what happens the disciples gathered around him so it means this group of disciples we don't know how many but just try to imagine maybe 15 people gathering around Paul's body that had been stoned and left for dead when the disciples gathered around him what happened it says he rose up and went into the city now that's a miracle a man who had been stoned his body must have been terribly bleeding wounded was left for dead but something powerful happened and the disciples gathered around him they must have obviously prayed ask God to heal and you see the result he rose up went into the city and the next day he went on his journey now that's impossible for a man who's been stoned right if a man had been stoned he probably spent the next six months maybe even eight months in in the hospital bed recovering but here Paul gets up, he walks into the city and the next day he continues on his journey to preach the gospel, you know. So this was a miracle. But what's, what do we see? It says the disciples gathered. So that means these people must have collectively joined together and prayed and God did some, a powerful miracle. That a man who was stoned and left for dead got up and walked to the city and the next day he goes on his journey to go preach. And that's amazing. But that shows us uh, the power of collective faith when people join together and pray. So like this we see many examples and we've only shared three examples from scripture we see many examples both in the old and new testament of uh, believers collectively having faith and then seeing god do some amazing things another in interesting thing is this that our collective faith uh, presents a solid front uh, it's like a wall of defense. Could somebody read Colossians chapter 2, verse 4 and 5 for us, please? Colossians chapter 2, verse 4 and 5. Now this I say, lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words. For though I am absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in spirit rejoicing to see your good order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. Mm, thank you. So I just want to highlight something here. Um, Paul is writing to the Colossians, the believers at Colossae. And, uh, you know, they are faced with a lot of attacks or intrusions uh, from people who are trying to deceive them and say all the wrong things, you know. And so there's this, there's a lot of things trying to come in to this group of this church, this church of belief, fam, group of believers. But then he says, I'm seeing something. I'm seeing a good order and steadfastness of your faith, your faith in Christ. Now, it's very interesting when you look at the Greek, that word good order and steadfastness. The word order, good order, 
really is a picture of um, the military, both are military words. And it's a picture of uh, people who are in line, they are in unbroken line, good order. So you can imagine a line of soldiers, everybody in place, in position, unbroken line. And then the word steadfastness is talking about uh, a firmness. It's like a, a an, an in, in impregnable wall of defense that's being put up by this unbroken line of soldiers. So what he's telling us is that your faith is like this impregnable wall of defense, a solid front, this unbroken line of defense that is protecting the community. It's a beautiful picture, actually, when you when you when you think of it. So here's a group of believers, and there are a lot of you know things that are trying to intrude, deceive, deception, and people are trying to do these different things. But these believers, in their faith, they have put up an impregnable, solid wall and line of defense. And nobody can penetrate that community because of their collective faith. So this is not one person's faith. This is all of them together. Their collective faith is a wall of defense and uh, it's uh, it's wonderful to you know to just kind of read this on the amplified he says though i'm away from you in body yet i'm with you in spirit delighted at the sight of your standing shoulder to shoulder in such an orderly array so it's like this military they're all in in order and the firmness and the solid front and steadfastness of your faith in christ so he says you know you're standing shoulder to shoulder, and it's uh, he's describing that their faith, their collective faith in Christ is like that. It's that solid front defense. So here's another thing we see, that when we have collective faith, we can actually together protect the uh, church community or the community of believers against uh, demonic intrusion, against intrusion from deception, wrong things, evil things, you know, that through collective faith, we protect the community of believers from uh, such things. So that's another uh, way uh, we can exercise collective faith. So we see collective faith being exercised for miracles. Uh, we see collective faith being exercised for deliverance. Uh, we see collective faith being exercised for Resurrection, healing and resurrection that was of Paul being raised from the dead. Now we are seeing collective faith being used for divine protection, uh, for the community, protecting the whole community. And uh, this collective faith and the, the faith of the community can keep growing, right? Uh, so we have referenced this verse before, uh, where Paul says, you know, he's writing to the believers and he says, uh, your faith grows exceedingly and your love for each other increases. So to that group of believers, he's saying, look, uh, your, your faith is growing. Your faith is growing. So, of course, that implies that every individual is growing in faith. But that results in the collective faith of people as a community. They are growing and they are walking in love towards each other. So we need to encourage that in our communities, uh, in our churches, that as a community, as a group of people, we will grow in faith, whether it's a small prayer group or whether it's a church community, uh, this can happen. People can grow in faith. But at the same time, we got to be careful about things that destroy uh, collective faith, you know, uh, because many times, uh, while we know that collective faith can produce wonderful results, wonderful results, uh, 
sadly, when people come together, there are problems that happen. And then that actually destroys or ruins and the collective faith that we could have and do wonderful things. And so we need to guard against those things. Uh, some of the things that we can think about, you know, are uh, murmuring and complaining. When we start murmuring and talking about each other and complain about each other, uh, then we're actually weakening ourselves. We're actually destroying collective faith. When we get into competition and strife with each other, you know, we're trying to outdo each other. We're trying to, you know, be better than each other. Uh, then we're actually giving room for the enemy to come and do evil work. And then it will just dissipate any effort or collective faith. You know, and uh, what's interesting is even among the 12 disciples of Jesus, there was a point when there was competition, you know, and uh, you saw if you may remember this in Matthew 20, where the mother of James and John, she came to Jesus and said, hmm, I have a request. Can you make sure that when you become king, my two sons, James and John, will sit one on either side? Now she's immediately trying to book the spot uh, and for her sons. And of course, that caused a lot of problems there among the rest of the disciples. And Jesus had to teach them about being servants and just serving people without desiring uh, a place of recognition and honor. So the strife, competition uh, can destroy collective faith. Um, and like that, you know, there are other things we need to be careful of self, pride, jealousy. These things disturb the dynamic within the community, within the group of believers, whether it's murmuring, complaining, competition, strife, jealousy, pride, self, selfish interests. And when it disturbs the dynamic, then it's difficult to get them to agree together and have collective faith and we lose out on the power of collective faith. So we need to guard the group and guard the people on that. Now, of course, when we as a group or as a, as a, as a community, as a team, we have collective faith, you know, we can go out and minister as, as a team. And uh, that's exactly what Jesus did when he sent his 12 disciples out. He sent them out two by two in teams of two. And uh, so they, as they ministered in teams of two, they saw the mighty works of God. And we see this in Mark chapter 6, uh, verses 7, 12, and 13. He got the 12 disciples and he sent them out two by two. So there, was, there were teams of two. And um, they went out and they preached and they saw mighty things. They, demons were cast out. People, the sick were healed as they went out to by two. And um, again, in Luke 10, the, and he just called another 70 people. He did the same thing with them. He sent them out two by two. And they returned and said, even the demons are subject to us in your name. So you can imagine these were Two people at a time. And remember what you, the verse we began with in Matthew 18. Jesus said, if two of you shall agree. If two of you shall agree. So here you can see Jesus intentionally sending them two by two. Both of you go. But then each group of two or each team of two, the people had to be in agreement. They had to flow together. They had to be in symphony. They had to be together as they ministered. And then they would see all these wonderful results. People were healed. Demons were cast out. And uh, wonderful things took place. And so it's a good thing to practice this, you know, um, that you could have people 
who will float together and minister together, whether in groups of two or, or more. Right? So I just want to... Okay, let's mute that. Okay. All right. Okay. So right, let me just go back here. So in a web we are in our uh you know, where we are in our church, in our prayer groups, in our communities. Uh, it's it's good for us to try and practice this where, you know, we could minister as teams, whether it's teams of two or more. You know, you could have three people, four people, it doesn't matter, but two or more people. I like how Jesus sent his disciples out. And uh, you could, you know, you could try to develop that uh, team ministry, that whole con concept of team ministry, because you un we understand the power of collective faith, two or more. So it doesn't have to be a huge group. Two or more. If you have collective faith, you can see things, right? But then uh, to we need to nurture this whole sense of team ministry. Uh, people are very comfortable ministering individually, but how about ministering as a team, two or more, right? And when you minister as a team, uh, we must learn to be in agreement, perfect agreement and harmony. That's important. Uh, avoid uh, any kind of uh, competition, strife or pride, which we had mentioned earlier. And when one person is ministering, the other person must back up, back up the one who's ministering, so 100% support them spiritually, like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, be in agreement. So even if one person is doing the ministry, doing the praying, uh, you know, whatever they're in, as they're ministering, the other person stands, you know, in agreement with them so that, uh, you know, we can have the faith and have a collective faith, right? Now, um, uh, Sometimes, sometimes, you know, I, I just, I'm just making this comment because uh, uh, I've observed uh, some of this and that's why I'm, I'm intentionally making this comment where what I've seen is sometimes there is, you know, some people feel superior to the others uh, when it comes to doing ministry and they leave other believers out saying, oh, oh their unbelief is going to affect our faith. And so I just wanted to address that, you know, will the un unbelief of, so let's say you have a group of eight, eight people or 10 people, let's say two are very strong believers and you've got six of them who are maybe not very strong. The question I want to address is, will the lesser faith of six people hinder the strong faith of two people? Because you know what, sometimes we see happen is these two people will just go off. So, okay, let's leave the six out because they don't have that great faith. And we will go and minister. Otherwise their unbelief will hinder our faith. But you know, that is not true. No, that's not true. You know, look at some biblical examples, examples in the New Testament, you know. Uh, think about Jesus and, the, and his 12 disciples in the boat. So you had 12 people who didn't believe, 12 people who are so fearful, and there was one person in faith. And what happened? Well, the boat didn't sink. The one person who was in faith, Jesus, calmed the storm. The unbelief of the 12, the fear and unbelief of the 12 didn't hinder the faith of one. Uh, think about when uh, there was this, this, this boy who was lunatic brought to Jesus' disciples. Uh, the, and you know, so you can imagine there are nine disciples who have just failed. They couldn't help the boy. They, and, and Jesus pointed out it was because of their unbelief. Here comes Jesus with the other three. So even if he said nine were in unbelief, nine who were in unbelief could not hinder the faith of Jesus in delivering the boy. 
right? So this theory or this idea that, oh, the unbelief of others will hinder my faith, um, uh, it doesn't seem to hold when you look at these examples. Um, there are many other times you find Jesus uh, moving out in faith uh, when his... All right, somebody, okay. All right. Um, okay, there were times when, uh, when Jesus and uh, his disciples uh, were ministering. Uh, uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I see Elisha's comment where he talks about Joshua and Caleb. You know, they went forward, uh, even though others uh, were in unbelief. Uh, now, in that case, God had to leave the people and believe out and let the people who had faith enter in. You know, so uh, so I, what I just want to say is you know, we see other examples where, where uh, Jesus moved in faith and, uh, you know, there were the unbelief of his disciples didn't hold him back. Case of Peter. Peter walked on the water to go to Jesus. And, uh, uh, you know, the rest of the disciples were in the boat. They were fearful, but Peter still walked on the water. Uh, the, the final example that many, or the example that many people quote is when Jesus went into the house of Jairus. He only took in three, Peter, James, and John. He told all the others to stay out, now, you know, stay away. And so people say, well, look, Jesus only took Peter, James, and John with him into the house. He didn't take the others. Uh, that's an example where, you know, you don't want the faith, the unbelief of others to hinder your faith. But that's not stated in scripture. That's an assumption that's made. But then you can also look at the whole picture. You know, there was a big crowd of people who were following Jesus. And if Jesus told nine people to stay out, it's possible that he told them to stay and minister to the crowd while he went and attended to the request from Jairus. So, uh, just as people can assume, try and assume that he told disciples stay out to because of their he didn't want their unbelief. That's not stated. But what is more likely is he probably told them to stay and minister to the crowd, which they always did. While well, he went out to uh, went to meet Jairus and go into his house, so he just took three of them, his three closest disciples, Peter, James, and John, and uh, he went in. And then, of course, maybe there wasn't enough room in the house, so he got rid of all the others, and he went in with Peter, James, and John to minister. Right? And uh, we don't see that Jesus was afraid of uh, that uh, you know, his team members would uh, weaken his faith. Right? So uh, I'm just putting that out there just to look at it from a different perspective. Uh, let's not operate from an air of superiority or I've got greater faith than you, so you don't come close to me because your unbelief might hinder my faith. I think that's just a wrong notion. Uh, you have faith in God and you lift others up rather than putting them down. Right? Um, now, another thing I've faced as a leader is that there are times when we exercise collective faith but then, you know, uh, we don't see it happen. And then people are looking at you as a leader saying, hey, what do you have to say? And this has happened at times, you know, uh, when we've had faith. Uh, I've led um, groups of people uh, here when we had to pray for resurrection and believe, you know, God to raise someone from the dead and, uh, so, you know, we've, we've been in faith, we've been praying together collectively for, for that, and uh, it didn't happen. And so obviously people are going to ask you, you're the leader, hey, what happened? Why didn't our collective faith produce a result? And uh, here's, you know, so I've, I've been through that and, this is how I've tried to handle that situ those situations when there's a failure in collective faith. Now, it is a lot of pressure, you know, because you're the leader, you're the one who led the group into 
trying to extend collective faith in God uh, for a particular situation. It didn't happen. So everybody's looking to you for an answer. And it's not a nice, <laughs> not a nice place to be. What do you do? Well, here's what I've tried to do. One is I've tried to be dead to self-reputation. That is, look, it's not about my reputation as a pastor or as a spiritual leader. You know, we are dead to it. We are beyond that. We are not here to protect our name or our reputation or our fame, none of that. Secondly, we're not here to defend God. God doesn't need any defense. In fact, God is our defender. We are not his defenders. So I just say, God, I know you are God and you don't need any man to defend you. So I'm not going to try and defend God and uh, try to give an explanation for God or, you know, why this didn't happen. No, God doesn't need a defense. Thirdly, uh, uh, what I've tried to do is never fault others. You know, never do that. I don't try to give an explanation saying, oh, you know, in our group, there were three people who didn't have faith or four people who were living in sin or that's why it didn't happen. Don't, never do that. Never fault others. You know, because we don't know. Uh, who are we to, you know, point fingers at, at others? Yeah. So never do that. Instead, you know, what we do is encourage. Say, hey, it's, a, it's going back to what we said earlier in the previous lecture. Encourage people to keep their eyes on God and his word. Say, look, I know what we prayed didn't happen, but God hasn't changed. His word hasn't changed. And we know any failure would be on our side, not, not on God's side, but we are not here to fault any person or anything. We are going to continue to encourage ourselves in God and we're going to continue to press on. We're going to continue to believe God. And should another occasion arise like this, of course, we're going to step in faith and walk, believe God for it. We're not going to, you know, we're not going to quit. So this is kind of what I've tried to do, you know, uh, when, when we faced failure collectively, which we have uh, on more than one occasion. And, uh, uh, you know, just, okay, look, this is not about me. Uh, this is about the kingdom of God. And we are learning how collectively to exercise faith, to see miracles or to see something happen. Uh, I, I don't have to defend God. God is big enough to take care of himself. Uh, I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to fault any person. That's just plain wrong to do. I'm going to encourage people and we are going to continue to press on to believe God for what's in his word, right? So this lesson is simply a, a lesson on collective faith uh, to, to let us know that, you know, there is, uh, there is power in collective faith, which we must tap into. Uh, we must learn to uh, engage in uh, and, and, and try to journey into it and, and, um, uh, I'm saying that, um, uh, you know, we can learn to minister in collective faith. Okay. Let's take some uh, uh, questions uh, on this. Um, so num Elisha mentions Numbers 13. Uh, uh, Joshua and Caleb. Elisha, you want to say something on that? Yes, that's that. Um, while you were sharing on uh, the collective faith and how um, sometimes we, we seem to think that the majority's unbelief is likely to affect uh, our, the minority's faith and that will cause God not to work miracles among us. I want to share a practical experience. Um, in a prayer meeting, in my local church some time ago, the prayer leader had the had the cause to uh, sack some people from the prayer meeting because uh, in in his assumption, he thought they, they didn't have faith. 
and one of those that he had um, had fallen into sin, and he said that he was not he was not uh, a good member to be in the team at that moment. So he sacked the person. And this one brings to my what we just said about the collective faith. How sometimes we wrongly assume that uh, when there's a majority of the people not in agreement with us, God cannot work anything among his children. I think uh, we should learn that the minority's faith, the minority plus God, the minority's faith is always dominant. And mm -hmm. that is uh, exactly what played out in the case of Joshua and Caleb. Two against the, the, the others. And the others successfully had even all the Israelites behind them. So it was God, Joshua and Caleb and a few others against the, 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 the many people that went to spy with the Israelites who had come to join them. But God uh, was able to do what he had promised to do for the people of Israel. So I, I want to thank you for sharing this with us. God bless you very much. Thank you. Thank you for sharing, Elisha. Thank you. Um, I see another comment there from Divya, but why then did Jesus not perform many miracles in his hometown? Yeah, Matthew 13, 58. That's true. So uh, in, in the case here in his own hometown, it was the unbelief of the people who were being ministered to, right? So that means they were reluctant even to receive from him. So their unbelief kept them from even coming to receive. So that's a different scenario from what, what we are talking about. We're talking about our team, right? So let's say, like you said, suppose we have a team of 10 believers uh, who are praying. Now maybe, you know, three or four are pretty strong in faith. Uh, the remaining six or seven may not be as strong in faith. Maybe they are young, etc. So amongst us, we shouldn't feel that just because we've got, uh, you know, just because there are three or four who are strong, they should go out separately and minister, and then we can minister together. So that's the scenario we're addressing. But uh, Matthew 13 is a different scenario where it's the crowd who are unwilling to come and receive from Jesus because, uh, you know, they, they're looking at Jesus saying, hey, he, he grew up here. This is our hometown. He was a carpenter's boy. How can he be the Messiah? How can he be the anointed one? We are not going to go and listen to him and receive from him. And so Jesus didn't do many miracles there because of their unbelief. Their unbelief kept them from coming to receive Christ. So the scenario is uh, 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 a little different. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Yeah. I have one more question. Can I ask? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, this is uh, a little different. Uh, like, uh, suppose we are in a group where, you know, uh, uh, like our faith is being challenged, even within the group, mm, or is it, it is a threat to our own faith. Mm. Uh, in such cases, uh, you know, what is the right course of action? Thank you. Okay. okay. So here, okay, so if that means these people are not in agreement Right. So, so, uh, so from what you said, let's say there's a group of 10 people, three people want to believe God and believe his word and his miracles. And, some, and then there are seven who say, no, 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 we don't want to. We don't want to believe God. That's not the way to, you know. So that means there is no agreement. Then what, but, you know, then you have to make a choice where the three who are in agreement go and believe God and make their journey with God, you know, and uh, the seven may not come along on that spiritual journey, but the three will have to move forward in faith. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, let's take the last two questions here. There's one from Elijah. Uh, what is the effect of reasoning, common sense on faith? 
Uh, that's a good question. And I think uh, one of our last chapters deals with this faith and reason. So this is also an area where many uh, feel or find it very difficult. So let me just give you a gist right now and we will then have go into the chapter. There is faith, there is reason, and then there is presumption. And we need to understand the difference. Reason is, see, God created our mind. So God gave us the ability to reason. Our mind is not evil by itself. Our mind was designed by God. And we need our mind to engage with the natural world. And uh, most of the time, we are using our mind. Um, our common sense, you know, when you, just when we go about our everyday life, we are using our mind and we have to because we are living in a natural world. So we must use our mind and let me put it like this. Don't use your faith to do the things you have to do as a natural person. That means, or let me put it like this, everything we do, we do by faith in God. But what you have to do in the natural, you have to do in the natural. So example, if you're crossing the street, it is my responsibility to look left and right, make sure there's no car vehicles going, and cross the road. Now, I have faith that I am divinely protected by God. He has given his angels charge over me to keep me in all my ways. So that's my faith all the time, every time. But when I'm crossing the road, I have to look left and right and then cross the street when it's safe. I can't close my eyes and say, I walk by faith and not by sight. And God will give his angels charge over me. I don't care if any car comes or any vehicle comes, they will stop. Angels are there. Uh, they can't get past the angel and I can't close my eyes and go. Uh, no, that, that's, that is presumption or literally that's foolishness. That's not even common sense. It's presumption, foolishness. So I have faith that God protects me all the time, but in what I have to do naturally, I have to use my reason, meaning what God has given me, right? I can't put faith here and say, I will walk by faith and all the cars will stop. I, I can't do that. And that's wrong. And God is not obligated to fulfill his word in that kind of a situation. But I am not walking according to you know, like common sense or reason that God has given, right? So we have to balance, we have to understand there is faith, but God has given me a responsibility, he's given me a mind to use to take care of this day-to-day -day things of life, right? So faith does not do away with plain common sense or good reason. And we have to be careful of presumption or foolishness, which we will talk about. Okay, we'll get into details on that a little later. Last one, uh, maybe the people were too thrown with Jesus and missed on mighty works of God. Yeah, Rosalind, yeah. So these people, they looked at Jesus as like, yeah, we know him, you know, uh, he grew up here. How can he be anointed by God? And so they missed out on what God wanted to do. Okay. It's time for us to wrap up today. So we covered two chapters. One is failure, how we handle it, uh, because we, are, we all would have faced it and we must learn how to handle it correctly. We talked about collective faith and we also talked about some of the wrong ideas people have, and, you know, how to handle that and how to handle, even if we face failures collectively, you know, the point is we must keep going forward uh, God is good, God is for us. We are the ones who are learning, right? We are the ones who are learning to grow our faith. 
uh, it's going to take time. It's not a thing that we all grow into overnight. Um, and so we need to make the journey. We need to get up, dust the dirt off our knees and keep going and journeying with God. And at the same time, I just want to leave, with this, leave us with this thought that uh, in this course, we're dealing with faith, but there are many other ways that God works the supernatural, uh, which we're going to learn in, in another course. Uh, there is the aspect of the anointing. There's the aspect of the presence of God, the glory of God, the gifts of the spirit, all of those things. So uh, a miracle can come into our lives through more than one way. Uh, and what we are learning now is faith in God, something that we can have, all of us can have uh, in our journey. At the same time, we must be open to God working through other ways, causing uh, his supernatural things to take place. Okay, so let's pause here. I'd like somebody to pray with us as a class and dismiss us. Uh, we'll continue this uh, next week. Can somebody just pray and dismiss us, please? We are praying. Please go ahead. We come before you, our uh, Heavenly Father. We thank you for this morning and the lessons that we have shared on faith. We thank you for the beautiful inspirations that you have brought to our hearts through Pastor Ashes. Father, we pray in the name of Jesus. If any one of if any one of us is having issues with his faith, Father, we pray and we come before you. So we come before you that Lord help our unbelief in the name of Jesus. Father, we pray, Lord, Lord, O God, that you will cause us at any time that we need to exercise faith in you. Father, cause us to exercise faith in you in the name of Jesus. Father, any time we need to Father, you help us to use in the name of Jesus, that your works might be seen in our midst. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Commit the rest of our days into your hands, O God. Continue to be with us and guide our steps. Be the light on our path and shine on our way. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, everyone. Uh, enjoy the rest of the day. Have a nice weekend. Enjoy your time of worship. God bless you. See you again.